Okay. Um, hello, everybody, dear ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you with our next presentation in the section as to learners and their environment strategies. I would like to warmly welcome our speaker today. And I'm not sure I get the pronunciation of your name right, so please forgive me. Or you Masadeh Am I right? Kind of. Yeah, it's a difficult name. It's our day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What was it again? All right. Okay. Um, um, I have already said this once today that I feel very privileged that I can chair this session. And as I said with Joseph, uh, I feel even more after what I have found out about the speakers today. I'm really, uh, really impressed. So just a few words about, about the speaker today. Um, I really don't know what's more interesting or where to start, but basically, um, um, or has got uh, over 20 years of experience at leading UK institutions teaching Arabic language and translation. Uh, legal translating and interpreting is uh, one of the key uh, uh, key issues that you are involved uh, in. But what is um, uh, for me, absolutely <laughs> interesting is that you worked uh, extensively with the United Nations agencies and that you also volunteered as an interpreter for the British Red Cross on issues of asylum and immigration. Uh, so uh, you have this both academic part and let's say less academic part. Um, and uh, as far as I understand, well, your main research interest is effective teaching methods of how to teach and learn languages effectively. Yeah? And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here and I give you the word now. Thank you very much, Linda. I mean, I am, I have to say, I mean, needless to say, I'm very jealous of those of you who are there. <laughs> uh, you know, I have been following uh, the, the conference on uh, social media and on Instagram mm -hmm. um, I, I want to thank the organizers uh, it's it looks like it's a uh, it, there has been great effort uh, to to put this conference together and um, and I'm really I'm happy as well very privileged to, to be part of the conference as well and I do hope that my presentation is going to be um, useful for some of the uh, attendants and um, I don't know I mean it's so weird because you can see me but I cannot see anyone so uh, mm -hmm. Hello, everyone, if there's anyone there. <laughs> I'm sure there are many people, but I don't know how well you can hear them, and uh, we, we see you. <laughs> and okay. Very well. Okay, can I then, uh, okay, can I please share my screen now, so uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so I shall start. So um, today my presentation or this study is, is began with the objective of uh, investigating the use of uh, reflective thinking in the teaching um, uh, of languages and in my uh, case uh, specifically Arabic. Um, however, since March uh, it has taken two um, new different routes which emerged as a, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and its uh, effects on teaching. Um, so first I will present the original idea of this uh, study and then I will touch on the two new um, uh, aspects of this presentation. Uh, okay, uh, it's not moving. Okay. So the main purpose of, of this study was, uh, as I said, is to uh, how to achieve the main uh, skills necessary for learning a language. Um, uh, through monitoring progress and self-evaluation. And this uh, can be achieved through reflective thinking. Uh, the two new aspects of this presentation, the new two aspects, was uh, how to use reflective thinking as a method uh, for assessment of independent work, specifically within the context of an open book online exam, and uh, how to use reflective thinking as a mean of assessment of engagement uh, within the blended online teaching uh, and within the framework, framework of the community uh, of inquiry or the CIF. 
So reflective thinking is not new, and uh, we all know that it's been used in so many uh, disciplines that adopt the informal uh, method uh, of learning. And um, those who employ the uh, PPL or problem solving learning. Um, we all know that through this, the students are in control um, of their learning. Uh, they are not only receiving uh, knowledge uh, in the traditional way, which we know as a strategy. Um, so, this form of learning, which is through the reflective thinking, also falls within this uh, new form or newish form of our model of teaching, which is called the hitagogy. And uh, the hitagogy is a, is a form of self-determined learning um, through which students are in control of their learning. Um, and this was defined by Hayden Kenyon in the 2000s. Uh, and this is not a random uh, uh, form of learning. There are bases to it and practices which have been uh, discussed by many scholars, uh, amongst them uh, was shown in 1983. So, how is um, reflective thinking, first of all, used as a problem-based model for learning Arabic? Um, of course, through reflective thinking, the students play a role in their active learning by monitoring their uh, progress uh, in the four main skills when you learn a language, which is reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Uh, this particular study or presentation was uh, was applied to final year students because I believe that um, you can you can use reflective thinking successfully when the, the students have reached a certain level of the language, and therefore therefore you can you can you can have successful results maybe at uh, level two or three. Um, or final, you know, as we call the final year students. This particular study uh, was um, applied to final year students of Arabic um, who are doing a degree in Arabic. So they would have studied Arabic uh, for three years prior to this year. Um, and uh, I focused it on uh, two skills, which is um, the speaking and the writing. And the speaking through uh, oral performances, which, is, which are the presentations, and the writing um, with essays. Um, the students were able to, through the reflective thinking, the students were able to link between theory and practice and um, they, ha they, they managed to employ the, the knowledge that they have gained in decision making in improving their performance. Of course, as a first step, students need to understand what is reflective thinking. So um, I have uh, uh, used um, the Gibbs model, which is the famous Gibbs model for uh, reflection, and which has the the three um, which which have the which has the three um, interlinking aspects uh, necessary for achieving the objectives. Um, so we have performance, reflection, and action. The way we apply these to uh, learning of a language uh, is obviously we have to um, interpret them. So with regards to performance, obviously, it is uh, the carrying out of the assignment. With reflection is engaging with the reports and uh, action is obviously the final stage where we act on the findings of the reports. The first stage, which is um, performance, um, uh, we all know that assignments um, are an integral part of languages and this is obviously language, um, you know, it's an integral part of uh, learning, and languages is not an exception. So in addition to normal homework, students will be given formative assessment, which we all know are like a form of assessment which uh, students get full feedback and they can be marked for it, but this, this mark does not get included in the final average. So this, this study or this presentation was based on uh, a series of formative assessments that were given to the students throughout the year. Um, as with any ass uh, assignments, you know, they, they were gradual, you know, uh, according to the level, to the theme uh, throughout the year as we progressed. Um, the second stage um, was the reflection. And this is where, you know, this is, this is where the main part is. Um, we all know that um, reflection can, um, can be whilst uh, a performance is ongoing, which what we call is a uh, Reflection on in monitoring, and uh, and uh, sorry, reflection in performance, which is monitoring, 
or it can be after the performance is completed, which is a reflection on performance, which is self-evaluation. So, therefore, I have designed a set of uh, forms or kind of guidelines that I give to the students uh, to, to follow. So it wasn't just, okay, go just tell me, reflect on, on your assignments. I wanted to guide the students, but again, not to guide them by telling them what to look for. I want them to tell me what their findings were as they progressed with the language. And um, of course, these these forms or guidelines were not uh, designed randomly. They were uh, designed within again the heterogogic design or uh, model. And um, if we look at the heterogogic design process, which is used now as a as a method uh, as a new model of teaching. It has three aspects, the learner contract, the reflection, and the outcome. The learner contract is the area where we as tutors or teachers or lecturers identify the needs of, for the students and uh, identify the learning outcomes. So then at that point, we start negotiating the assessment, how we, how we, how we um, uh, create them, what is needed, uh, how can we adapt them, how can we adapt the curriculum. So, through this is how we identify the language skills that, that need to be uh, developed. Um, the second stage, which is the reflection or the feedback, is how we design these assignments in a way that we can help the students to feed on them, how to self-reflect. So, so, so this is the stage where the students are being able to, um, to, 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 to self-determine how to go about their assignments and how to do them and to identify the weaknesses and uh, um, strength uh, particular problems so this is the stage where it, what we call is reflected in performance eventually after students have uh, completed a few uh, reflective reports while performing they will need to then reflect on the reflection and that would be kind of like the outcome. Is this where the, the, the learners start to assess the outcome and identify their competencies and skills? So this is the um, reflection uh, on performance. Uh, to give you just an example of the, of the forms or the guidelines that I have designed. So um, this following one is the framework of design, that I've designed for oral presentations. And, um, you know, it's speaking is a, is, a, is a total different kind of skill to writing. We also have to, uh, speaking is just, it does not only involve the language, it also involves uh, public speaking, it involves the psychological state. So there are so many elements that uh, get, you know, that are involved in, uh, in a student given a presentation in a foreign language. So, and sometimes this aspect gets um, disregarded and not looked upon. So these are one of the things that I kind of like encourage students to talk about in their reflective writing when they reflect about their performance and presentation. Not not just the language, but also how they how they feel about the presentation, the confidence issue, the sharing with the colleagues, sharing with um, with the with their tutors, whether they would prefer to record it, whether to they prefer to for it to be face-to-face uh, -face, and how this impacted on the actual language. So so, so this was the, I know I'm aware of the time, so I'm, I'm not going to go into it in details, but I'm happy to share the, the, these uh, uh, frameworks uh, later. You know, later. Um, the other uh, framework was to do with essay. Now this is, this I've, I've designed them to be in two stages. Again, because I don't, I do not want the students, I do not want to tell them what to look for, because it's as if I'm telling them make mistakes in these areas. Okay, so uh, so the, the the first stage of the reflective report is um, is is very uh, general uh, and. Um, just to kind of make them start thinking about how they're writing, where are the problems in their writing, without pinpointing or, or specify, specifying where the problems are. So after the students have done a few uh, uh, writing assignments and then they get the feedback from their tutors, which it, it, it's, it's so funny, but sometimes you find that the, the mistakes are always the same recurrent ones and 
in, in Arabic in particular, we always have, uh, um, I, I don't know if, if I have any um, Arabic uh, speaking people in the audience, but you know, we have uh, issues with gender agreements, we have um, um, issues with what we call idapa and, and you know, verb conjugations. And uh, so it, it is kind of like the same recurring mistakes and the students, no matter how many times you, you, you give them feedback, they just do the same mistakes again. So, so after they, you know, you give them your feedback, then it, it is so surprising that when they start writing their more in-depth reflective report, they begin to actually realize where their mistakes are. So this, this is where the second stage comes. And this is where the, we give them the reflective report, which has a more detailed um, uh, guidelines. Uh, on on um, uh, on on their uh, assignments and um, and this is like you know I'm, you know I'm, as I said I'm not going to go through it but but this is where we where they start actually including examples of where they identified that they made a mistake mm -hmm. they start actually um, uh, seeing it more clearly and uh, it, it's so refreshing to know that they, this this that they. That you know, at the, at the later stage in the in the year, last year, I've realized that they I've noticed that the students have actually began to realize where the mistakes are, and they they start correcting themselves. Um, so, so obviously, then then comes the final reflective report, which is kind of like the reflection on all the progress uh, throughout the year, whether it's to do with with any of the of the skills. All right, I will just jump in. I'm not sure if you can see me anywhere, uh, but you have five more minutes so that we can have at least five minutes for our discussion. Just to okay. talk about the okay. Okay. So okay. Uh, yeah, I will. I will do it. Okay. So, okay. So, so, okay. so basically, the last the last stage would be the action, and that's the action. That's when uh, students. Uh, start acting on their reports as i said and this is where tutors align their feedback with the with the findings of the of the students and uh, uh, and then they can they can uh, uh, identify both general and specific individual areas for improvement and offer advice um, okay so i'm aware of the time so i'm just going to quickly move on to the, the two new aspects which i believe are very very important as well so uh, the near term was that, um, you know, I'm, I'm safe to, to say that in March 20, when the whole world came into face-to-face uh, -face with the COVID-19 pandemic, all higher education institutions were forced to move their teaching online within the space of 24 hours. One of the major issues that we all faced was the, was the final exams were, that were due to take place within a couple of months from the lockdown. Uh, Decisions were made, um, you know, at so many um, higher education um, institutions that these uh, exams are going to be done off campus and online. Um, there were so many issues to do with that. Uh, uh, in our case at the University of Manchester, our students were given a, a window of 24 hours to do these exams. Now, we all know that with languages, this is really puts us in a dilemma that, you know, these are language exams. You give students 24 hours, open book with uh, dictionaries, with access to resources. How can we uh, kind of police this, uh, this exercise? So, uh, so one of the, uh, I, one of the, uh, in order to maintain the integrity of our exams and uh, ensure that they are not compromised, of course, we had to make uh, amendments to the, <coughs> excuse me, to the form of the exams and um, change their format. But one of the things that we have actually used is that we requested that our students to write um reflective reports so we were so lucky in the final year that our students only the exam consists of a translation and an essay and uh, in in that sense using the reflective reports was very useful because uh, it was kind of like a quality assurance exercise to um to 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 ensure in a way that the students have completed these exams on their own so when we've asked them to write reflective reports to explain why these decisions were made specifically to translation, mm -hmm. uh, with providing examples why choices were made, why translation translation strategies were chosen over others, 
you kind of had had this, we had a sense of who actually fully engaged with the exam and who maybe just put it on Google Translate. So at that point, obviously, because of you know it's the university regulations, this the assessments, the reflective reports were not included in the assessment. But um, uh, we've had um, we've had confirmation now or approval that uh, as of the January exams 2021 these reflective reports will be included uh, and marked as part of the assessment and and i uh, i understand also that many of the uk universities that i'm in touch with have also adopted this this model mm -hmm. so here again the reflective writing has become um, a, a, a necessary tool uh, for specifically online open book exams um, the, the the third part of this presentation uh, was um, uh, is how to use a reflective thinking as a means of assessment of engagement. So, as mentioned before, the constraints of COVID-19 uh, pandemic has forced us to move teaching online. And we at the University of Manchester were instructed to create a virtual learning experience for students within the framework of blended learning. The framework of blended learning we all you know we all understand is that and we all know that it's a mixture mixture of synchronous and synchronous teaching. So for me uh, in order to ensure that my team have a structured uh, or have a structure to follow in, in preparing their syllabi and uh, to ensure consistency amongst courses and levels I suggested that we, we follow the model of community of inquiry to prepare these models to, to kind of have a balanced blended learning virtual environment. So the community of inquiry framework uh, is perhaps the, the, best, uh, the best known and uh, researched um, um, uh, model for designing learning experiences uh, in an online environment as it, because it represents a constructive learning experience um, through the development of three in interdependent elements, uh, the teaching presence, the social presence, and the cognitive presence. Uh, if we look at the figure below, we look at, we see that um, um, the, the teaching presence, the social presence, and the cognitive presence. So I took these uh, and I also interpreted did them in a way to serve the learning of languages or the teaching of languages. So uh, the way I've interpreted them is that the teaching presence is would be the asynchronous teaching, where we uh, where we regulate the learning by in, uh, by the engagement with the goals and the directions. Like you know, this is all to do with like pre-recorded material where our uh, objectives and intended learning outcomes are spelled out, explanations, guidance for materials preparation before class, online exercises and quizzes. Then the social presence is the synchronous teaching, uh, which supports the discourse by engagement with participants, which is the face-to-face -face learning, which we are all experts in now, in all forms of uh, activities. And the third aspect of, of the community of inquiry framework is the cognitive presence. And the cognitive presence is the independent learning. And this is when we support the discourse by engagement with content. And how do we engage with content is by consolidating activities. One of the main things that we can, can use, again, is the uh, reflective thinking. So we can, we, can, we can consolidate activities and independent learning by, uh, of course, homework, by uh, creating a student hub. But one of the things that can um, also help is, create, is, is including reflective thinking journals and dossiers as, as part of this um, uh, virtual online um, environment for students. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I understand that I went too quick over this, but I thought these, these two new uh, emerging um, aspects of, of reflective thinking are very, you know, very relative to what we are all going through now. Uh, within this new uh, virtual teaching environment. Uh, I know I'm, I'm aware that this uh, merits like further investigation. Um, so, um, and I'm aware of the time now, so uh, I'm just gonna leave it as, as this and um, that's it for me today. And I hope that was helpful and happy to take any questions.
Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you for perfect time management. And uh, I'm opening the discussion both in the virtual as well as the physical world, plus the YouTube. There's a YouTube question. I don't know if Kola is able to see it or you can read it. Are, are, are you able to see the YouTube comments right now? I I cannot see, uh, I will stop sharing now, but I cannot see anything. All I can see is the uh, black screen with room 43 in it. Uh -huh. Would you like to read it? Which one do you mean? Okay, so I'll read the question for you, Oreb. Um, I think your reflective model could be very useful for intermediate and advanced language levels, but have you tried the model with beginners level? No, I have to. I have to admit, yeah. I mean, I, I did say at the beginning that I find that this is this could be uh, more successful with with the students who have uh, reached a, a particular, like you know, a good stage of, of their language to be able to identify the problems. Uh, beginners, um, uh, I don't think they have developed the competency to. I mean, they are still in this stage. When we we have to always understand that when we talk about Arabic. We are talking about absolute beginners, like we, we, we start by teaching the alphabet. So mm -hmm. when we talk about beginners, they ha it, it takes them a while to kind of build their vocabulary and the grammar and to, to reach that stage where they can, where they can be able to self-determine their learning. So I'm not, uh, I am not quite sure how it would work for beginners, but you know, I'm happy to investigate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask uh, here uh, the participants who would like to ask something. Um, if not, uh, uh, I will ask one question. Um, uh, I love this idea, in fact, of self-determined learning. I think it's the, the very um, basis of success, or I believe, uh, I believe so. I wondered whether your students were actually open to this idea of uh, reflective thinking, whether it's something they are used to, or whether it's something totally new, because you mentioned you created guidelines for them. So I wonder if it's part of the, let's say, British school system, if the students are led to this way of thinking about language learning or not, whether it's something new for them. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to take credit for for the use of reflective thinking. Of course, you know it is a, it's a form that, of of, of uh, uh, teaching that that's been adopted by so many disciplines, as I said. But uh, uh, but but uh, I felt that my students have actually. I mean, it was new. This is something that I've introduced uh, this year to the students. Um, and therefore, as I said, this was not included in the assessment. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it was I, I introduced it as a as a form of of, of their you know self development, mm -hmm. uh, and um, they were they were open to the idea. They've enjoyed it. They've engaged mm -hmm. in it. One thing I would have to say that these reflective reports are written in English, not in Arabic, mm -hmm. with examples from Arabic. Okay. So uh, obviously, because I, I did not want to like. You know, scare the students by you know, in, in addition to all the assignments and the work they have to do, is now that they have to start writing a reflective report in the in Arabic or the language that they are learning. So, so they, as I said, they they were open to it. They, they enjoyed it. Um, and one of the things that I'm also thinking of doing now, because we are in an uh, in a virtual environment, uh, is that uh, maybe create um, um, some kind of a blog or a journal where students can actually share their reflective thinking so they can uh, kind of like share their experiences and that would be like a, another step where rather than just identifying my weaknesses then share them and maybe like you know with, and it is, it's only just to kind of create a classroom virtual environment where students are sharing things not just uh, sharing them with the tutor mm -hmm. so uh, so I, I think I think it's the way forward with with, with learning languages. I do not believe in a, a, a spoon feeding. Um, I mean, when you introduced me earlier, you said that I have done like so many things. 
I have I have I've become a strong believer in, in reflective thinking. Um, before before beginning to to focus on teaching Arabic, I used to teach translation studies and interpreting mm -hmm. studies. And one of the things that we taught in interpreting was conference interpreting, where we taught the, the simultaneous and consecutive interpreting. And these are based on skills. There is no way you can you can teach someone to become an interpreter. They have to learn it themselves and mm -hmm. we always found that reflective thinking is one of the the, the the most important tools in helping students to develop their skills uh, and therefore i'm hoping that it will work with uh, languages as well thank you very much I'm, I'm really sorry i have to finish uh, this uh, this session thank you very much once again both the participants as well as the speakers and good luck with uh, with your work and i hope to see you sometime in person in berlin which would be thank you thank you very much and uh, thanks for the attendance and and uh, hopefully that was good and uh, you have my email so if you would like to get in touch with me um, um and i'm happy to also share the powerpoint presentation and the slides right, great. and thank you so much linda and, uh, have a nice good luck day. good luck with the conference thank you thank you bye bye, bye. bye.